I'm Fred Rutz. I teach in the Civil Engineering Department at the University of Colorado, Denver. We're going to study fillet welds. And the scope of our project is that uh, we will design some small steel assemblies to be connected with fillet welds. Then we'll fabricate these designs, again, using fillet welds. Uh, so design, I'm going to talk about design. How do we design fillet welds for structural steel? The weld connects two perpendicular pieces of structural steel. There may be some variation in fillet welds. For example, the exposed surface may be concave or convex. Uh, there may be variations in the weld penetration into the base metal. And the designer is not going to know any of this ahead of time. Let's take a look at this photo. Even though this weld was made by a very proficient welder, small variations can be seen. This is normal. Engineers envelope their uncertainty and take variations into account in their designs. For design, we will make a fundamental assumption that the weld surface is flat and the weld cross section is triangular. The dimension of interest is called the throat. Of course, the weld will have length. The area defined by the throat dimension times the weld length gives us an effective weld area. Here's our throat length and the shear plane is the effective weld area. We will remember that fillet welds transfer shear. How much shear should we design for? That value comes from structural analysis. The part within this uh, red ellipse is our fabricated assembly. The remaining parts are simply for attachment to the testing machine. And notice we have a load path. Eventually the force comes into welds, then into two plates, and then into other welds. The effect of weld area in all our tests will be constant. The variable will be the weld length, and thus the weld's strength. For our test that we're calling A, we will design the parts such that the welds are intended to be weaker than the adjacent structural steel. Let's take a look. Welds, welds, these welds are only an inch and a half long. The load path must transfer from the welds through these steel plates and into corresponding welds below. For our test B, everything will be similar, but the weld length will be greater. So that weld will have a greater uh, strength. And we'll also use a weaker plate. So we expect, in this case, the steel plate to uh, fail first and the welds to hold. We're going to design using a method called the strength design approach. It's based on ultimate strength considerations, uh, sometimes abbreviated SD, and sometimes referred to as load and resistance factor design, or LRFD. Our first case, which is our short weld and strong plate, we're going to have a weld leg dimension of 3 sixteenths of an inch, a fillet weld that is one and a half inches long. In this case, our throat is, of course, 0 0.707 times the 3 sixteenths leg dimension, or 0 0.133 inches. Our effective weld area will be the 0 0.133 inches, the throat dimension, times the one and a half inches, the length dimension, bringing us to an area, an effective weld area of 0.199 square inches. Our ultimate strength of the weld, or nominal strength, R sub n, is going to be the nominal stress of the weld metal times the area, the effective weld area. And the nominal stress of the weld metal is the weld metal tensile strength. In our case, this will be 70 KSI. And we'll reduce this by a factor of 0.6 to account for shear, because we're not going to be loading the weld metal in tension. We will be loading it in shear. So there's our nominal stress times our effective weld area. The nominal strength, or ultimate strength, will be the terms just mentioned, the 0.6 for shear times the tensile strength of the weld metal times the effective weld area. We plug all our numbers in and we get 8.36 kips per weld. And of course there are four such welds in the assembly, so we multiply by four and we get a nominal strength for our assembly for the welds of 33.4 kips. Our design strength would be reduced by a strength reduction factor called the fee factor, uh, which is 0.75, and that's a, a code requirement. So 0.75 times our ultimate strength, or nominal strength, leads us to 25 
5.1 kips design strength for our welded assembly. We'll compare this to the plates. Nominal strength of the plates will be the ultimate stress of the plate material times the effective area of the plates. Our tensile strength of the material, which is A36 steel, has a, and that by specification has a minimum strength of 58 KSI. It might be stronger, but as designers, we don't know that ahead of time. There are two such plates in our load path. Each plate has a cross section of 3 8 inch by 6 inches. That leads us to 261 kips nominal strength for our plates. Compare the 261 for the plates to the 33 kips we calculated for the welds. 261 is considerably larger than 33, so we expect the welds to fail before the plates. Let's move on to our second case. Everything is the same now, except the weld length is six inches instead of one and a half. I'm going to go through the exact same calculation method using this longer length, six inches. And that brings us to 134 kips nominal strength for our welded assembly. Design strength of our assembly would be the strength reduction factor times that nominal strength, or 101 kips in this case. Let's compare our nominal strengths of welds to the nominal strength of the plates. In this case, and it's the same equation as before, we'll use area of 3 16 inch times 3 inch for the plates. These are smaller plates. There are two of them times the tensile strength of the plate material. That leads us to 65 kips. 65 kips, nominal strength for the plates, is less than the 134 kips we calculated as nominal strength for the welds. Therefore, we expect the plates to fail before the welds. And we will uh, now proceed to uh, fabricating these uh, specimens. Gas metal arc welding, GMAW, sometimes referred by its subtypes, metal inert gas welding, MIG, welding or metal active gas welding, MAG, is a welding process in which electric arc forms between a consumable MIG wire electrode and the workpiece base metal, which heats the workpiece base metals, causing them to melt and fill a joint with consumable wire. The most common applications of gas metal arc welding use a constant voltage power supply a result any change in the arc length which is directly related to the voltage results in a large change to heat input and current output a shorter arc length causes much greater heat input which makes the wire electrode melt more quickly and thereby restore the original arc length this helps operators keep the arc length consistent even when manually welding with handheld welding guns. To achieve a similar effect, sometimes a constant power source is used in combination with the arc voltage controlled wire feed unit. In this case, a change in the arc length makes the wire feed rate adjust to maintain a relatively constant arc. As you can see in the demonstration included in the video, I am using a circular motion and pausing at the top, waiting for the metal to fill up to the proper level with each pass. A metallic alloy wire called a MIG wire. Though selection alloy and size is primarily based on the composition of the metal being welded. The process variation being used joint design and the metal surface conditions. Electrode selection greatly influences the mechanical properties of the weld and is a key factor of weld quality. In general, the finished weld metal should have mechanical properties similar to those of the base metal in which no defects and or continuities or contaminants or porosity within the weld to achieve those goals, a wide variety of electrodes exist. The commercially available electrodes contain deoxidizing metals such as silicon, manganese, titanium, and aluminum in small percentages to help prevent oxygen porosity. Some contain metals such as titanium and zirconium to avoid nitrogen porosity. Depending on the process, variation, and base metal being welded, the diameters of electrodes used in the GMAW typically range from 0.7 to 0.4 millimeters. The smallest electrodes, generally up to 1.14 millimeters, 0.045, are associated with short circuit metal transfer process, which is the process we've used in this demonstration here. GMAW techniques. 
GMAW's basic technique is uncomplicated, with most of being individuals being able to achieve reasonable proficiency in a few weeks, assuming proper training and sufficient practice. As much of the process is automated, GMAW relieves the welder operator of the burden of maintaining a precise arc length as well as feeding filler metal into the weld puddle. Coordinated operations that are required in other manual welding processes, such as shielded metal arc welding. GMAW requires only the welder guide the gun and proper position and orientation of the cup along the area to be welded, as well as periodically cleaning the gun's gas nozzle to remove spatter and buildup. Additional skills includes knowing how to adjust the welder so the voltage wire feed rate and gas flow rate are correct for the materials being welded and sizes being plugged. Maintaining a relatively constant contact tip to work distance, the stick out distance as it's called, is important. Excessive stick out distance may cause the wire to prematurely melt, causing a sputtering arc, and may also also cause shielding gas to rapidly disperse, degrading the quality of the weld. In contrast, insufficient stick out may increase the rate at which the spatter builds up inside the gun's nozzle. In extreme cases, may cause damage to the gun's contact tip. Stick out distance varies for different GMAW weld processes and material applications. The orientation of the gun relative to the weldment is also important. It should be held so as to bisect the angle between the workplaces. That is at 45 degrees for a fillet weld and at 90 degrees for a welding on a flat surface. Travel angle or lead angle is the angle in which the gun with respect to the direction of travel should generally remain approximately vertical. However, the desirable angle changes somewhat depending on the type of shielding gas being used. With pure inert gas, the bottom of the torch is often slightly in front of the upper section, while the opposite is true when using welding with atmospheric carbon dioxide. Position welding. That is, welding vertical or overhead joints may require the use of weaving technique to assure proper weld deposition and penetration. In position, gravity tends to cause molten metal to run out of the puddle resulting in cratering and undercutting, two conditions that produce a weak weld. Weaving consistently moves the fusion zone around so as to limit the amount of metal being deposited into any one point. Surface tension then assists in keeping the molten metal in the puddle until it is able to solidify. Development and position welding skill takes a lot of practice but is usually soon mastered. For this project, we're using an SMAW manual process. We're using a 7018 332 diameter stick electrode, which is then consumed using a DC process. SMAW stands for shielded metal arc welding. The electrode used is 7018, 70,000 pound tensile strength. One equals the positions, which is all, and the one and the eight together equal the chemical composition of the flux coating around the rod. With this process, the Oxygen is dispelled by the burning of the flux as the electrode is consumed. And for this particular weldment done in the 2F flat position, we are pausing at the top due to the fluid dynamics involved with liquid metal wanting to sag down. So as you can see in the video, we will pause at the top for a second to let it fill and then bring it around and do it again using a circular motion, always circling in the forward direction towards the high. After this weld is completed, it is necessary to use a mechanical cleaning to make sure that the weld is in good condition. Typically a wire wheel combined with a chipping hammer to get rid of the excess slag coating on top, which not only protects the weld, but helps to float out surface impurities. And that's some basics of fillet welding. Thank you for watching.